Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to our April edition of the FHWA ASHTO uh, Asset Management Webinar Series. My name is Matt Hardy. I'm the Program Director for Planning and Performance Management here at ASHTO. I want to apologize in advance if you hear kids running around or dogs in the background or doorbells ringing or anything like that, because I think as many of you, uh, we're all working from home, and uh, I'm also trying to learn how to homeschool my kids at the same time. So there could be other sort of management efforts going on as well, more of a people management effort. Um, so to all of you, again, welcome. Uh, this is webinar number 43 in our Transportation Asset Management webinar series that has been sponsored by both FHWA and AASHTO. We have presented webinars in this series almost every two months, uh, going back to 2012 on a variety of topics related to, to asset management. This was before MAP21 went into effect and FAST Act. So we've been doing this for quite a while. Back in February, during our last webinar, uh, it took uh, the, the topic that we covered was asset management and building information management systems. Um, that was a very uh, timely uh, webinar and um, it, was, it was good. And if you missed it, you can still go back and enjoy it. Uh, you can go to the TAM portal and find it there. The AASHTO TAM portal is the www.tam-portal.com. And you can go there. We have recordings of all the previous webinars, many other webinars that we've done in addition outside of the FHWA AASHTO TAM webinar series. As many of you know, you can register for upcoming webinars as they are announced, including our next webinar in June on integrating the TAM and uh, with the STIP, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Program and you will find archives again of previous webinars there. So the next one is in June. Um, you will find links to video and slides from today's webinar at the website, again, TAM portal, tam-portal.com. You can also download the slide deck uh, for today's webinar from the handout functionality on the uh, GoToWebinar um, dashboard uh, feature. As always, if you ever have any suggestions for future webinar topics, uh, or have questions for the presenters to, uh, during today's webinar, please submit them using the GoToWebinar Q&A functionality. Uh, it's easiest to sort of type in your questions and then we can manage them. If we can't get to all of your questions today, the nice thing about typing them in is that we can download them and we can get back to you um, with the, uh, answers to those questions. So again, please use that Q&A functionality to uh, ask your questions at the end of the presentation uh, we'll be moderating the uh, Q&A to the best of uh, our, the best of our ability. Uh, and again, if we can't get to your question, it's good to have it there, and that way we, we can get back to you. Um, and with that, again, thank you uh, for uh, uh, participating uh, today. I hope everybody is staying safe and, and healthy as best they can. And I look forward to seeing this, literally seeing many of you in person as soon as possible, uh, especially many of the people that I work with, uh, Steve Gay. Uh, Yana and Perry up at Spy Pond. I uh, can't wait when we can actually be in person to sort of see each other. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over to my good friend Steve Gay for a welcome to all of you on behalf of our co-sponsor, FHWA. So, Steve, it's all yours. Hey, thank you so much there, Matt. FHWA, in cooperation with ASHTO, are very pleased to sponsor this Transportation Asset Management webinar series. We are particularly happy to see so many of you joining us today for the 43rd webinar out of this area. We're looking forward to seeing you on many more webinars to come. Today we're looking at geotechnical asset management and asset management. We have a special introduction, so I'm not going to talk long today, but for the state DOTs who have been on the regional calls, you know I often bring up well, what about the slopes? What about those walls? I think that the geotech assets are uh, one of my favorite subjects, beyond pavements and bridges. I think I have to say that. And I know Silas will be giving that introduction. We often talk about, hey, where are we with this new guide and all this sort of thing. So I'm really excited about today's webinar. And I, I think you're going to really enjoy it, the presentation. And I hope you all learn a lot this afternoon. Like I said, I'm really looking forward to it. With that, I'm gonna pass it to Yana Park, a Spy Pond partner, to share our agenda and objective for today's webinar. Yana, thank you. Thanks, Steve. 
Now, the purpose of the webinar series is to share lessons learned, ideas, and knowledge with the asset management community. For this webinar, the primary learning objectives are building working knowledge of key concepts and definitions relevant to geotechnical assets and transportation asset management, beginning to apply this knowledge in the context of agencies, TAM programs, and plans in order to answer the following questions. What approaches are agencies taking to geotechnical asset management? What benefits can agencies expect by better integrating geotechnical assets with existing TAM processes? What are key lessons learned for agencies as they move forward with geotechnical asset management? And of course, to share lessons learned, ideas, and knowledge. For the, uh, for the agenda today, Silas Nichols will kick off the webinar and share with us an FHWA update on geotechnical assets and TAM. Following Silas's FHWA presentation, Mark Vesley of VGC Engineering will deliver an overview of NCHRP Research Report 903, um, which is on geotechnical asset management guidance. This report is the second volume of an implementation guide for geotechnical asset management. After Mark, we'll have Chris Merklin of Ohio DOT, who will break down the agency's perspectives on geotechnical assets and TAM. Gavin Gotro will finish our series of presentations with an overview of geotechnical assets and TAM at Louisiana. Just a few, uh, another reminder, please submit your comments or questions using the Q&A feature on the webinar control panel anytime during today's presentation. And, respond, and in response to the most frequently asked question, yes, we'll make the slides and video available after today's webinar at tam-portal.com. Now let's get started with a presentation from Silas Nichols, Principal Bridge Engineer at FHWA Office of Bridges and Structures. Silas has been with Federal Highways for 18 years, both in headquarters and with the Resource Center, where he is currently responsible for providing leadership and direction for FHWA's national geotechnical team through technical developments for support of policy and guidance and coordination with industry and professional groups. Now I'll hand it over to Silas. Thank you. And um, boy, this is this is probably the most normal thing I've done since I've had to stay in the house all of my life here. I know how to do webinars. So this is great. But um, I, this isn't so much a presentation as just a, a quick um, introduction. And then I'm going to let uh, Mark, Chris, and Gavin really sort of walk us through um, what it is we're going to be doing here today. But um, I just want to take a few minutes to sort of frame um, geotechnical asset management as it relates to transportation asset management. Um, as we know, states are now required by law to develop risk-based asset management plans for national highway system to improve or preserve the condition of the assets and the performance of the system. Um, all the states must address pavements and bridges as part of their asset management plans, but they're also encouraged to include all that infrastructure assets within the highway right of way and the risk-based asset management plans. This can also include you know, roads that are not on the NHS and other things that are going on. With the state DOTs adopting transportation asset management programs and developing asset management plans for bridges and pavements, the FHWA's National Geotechnical Team faces the challenge of trying to contribute to transportation asset management by developing a geotechnical asset management program that supports holistic management of infrastructure assets. Because most of our assets or elements of assets, if it's for instance a foundation of a bridge, are buried, it's not only extremely difficult to manage the condition of most of the geotechnical assets, but it's extremely difficult to develop an approach to understanding system performance. Um, next slide. So over the last few years, the geotechnical program um, and NCHRP have had a few developments that have uh, come into our offices that were sort of getting into position right now to start to push out to the states in some form under the umbrella of geotechnical asset management. Um, those include the recently completed NCHRP 2446 project on geotechnical asset management, which developed an implementation manual um, and is published under report 903, 
Mark Vesely will be talking about that here shortly. Um, we had a risk-based protocol put together for MSC walls um, that was developed by Geocomp uh, engineers out of Boston. Um, we uh, attacked MSC walls early because we do think it's one of our uh, highest risk uh, geotechnical assets out there. and We wanted to try and get our arms around um, a protocol for dealing with those specifically. Our federal lands offices uh, developed a protocol for managing unstable slopes. Um, the federal aid side of the program, the program office, um, are looking at that protocol at the moment, and we're trying to broaden that out to become more of a slope management tool, not just an unstable slope management tool. Um, we recently completed a geohazards framework. Uh, the report is currently being reviewed by our offices of public affairs and our legal office so that we can get that into position to publish, uh, but it actually attacks the um, subcategories of geohazards within our asset classes. And then finally, uh, the development of DIGS, which was a pooled fund study that ran for several years led by the Ohio Department of Transportation. Uh, but that uh, really focuses on our ability to manage data, geotechnical data as an asset. And so that will also be lumped into this. Um, and we'll be looking over the course of the next um, a few years at how we're gonna be pushing all of these out in an effort to frame a geotechnical asset management program. And so the strategy that we're sort of working on for GAM um, considers uh, performance expectations for, for these proposed asset classes that we're, we're thinking about and protocols for advanced decision-making and program delivery. Um, the development of what will ultimately be FHWA's program uh, will be informed by recommendations from um, the NCHRP uh, 2446 project, um, and also the successful practices and lessons that we're learning from a lot of states that are already working on implementation programs around the country. Um, next slide. And so as I, as I wrap up here, um, I would encourage you to contact us, um, you know, as you think of questions or think of things that you think might help us out in, in starting to push this forward. Um, and I will tell you that uh, today, the purpose of the webinar is to really just have a discussion on what we think asset management uh, geotechnical asset management will look like within this broader framework of transportation asset management. Um, and we're going to do that through three different presentations. Um, one that summarizes the NCHRP um, project and the 903 report, which has been the basis for how a number of states have begun the process of implementing geotechnical asset management. And then to just get firsthand um, presentations from a couple of states that we know have already started the process um, and to just hear some of their um, uh, successes and lessons learned as they begin the process of implementing programs in their states. And so with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it back over and we'll let Mark Russell get underway. Thanks, Silas, for that introduction and overview. Now we'll hear from Mark Wesley of VCG Engineering. Mark is a principal engineer with VCG Engineering in Golden, Colorado. Mark has 25 years of experience in geological hazard and risk ass assessment, emergency response to slope and other ground movement, and design for bridge foundations, retaining walls, pavements, and slope stabilization projects. During his career, Mark has worked with state departments of transportation, federal lands, railroads, local agencies, and in more than 12 states. His recent technical work includes serving as principal investigator for the NCHRP study to develop the implementation manual for risk-based geotechnical asset management, or better known as GAM. This is what he's going to talk about today. Mark also has been involved in other formulative GAM efforts, including risk-based GAM methods for Alaska DOT, implementation strategies for federal lands highways, and geotech geohazard and retaining wall asset management for Colorado DOT. Now I'll hand it over to Mark. Thank you. Um, and just to uh, confirm my screen hopefully is uh, projecting. <laughs> um, okay. Yep. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. We can, yeah, we can see it. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning, depending on where you're at in the country right now. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, an overview of, of what we even mean when we say geotechnical assets and also how the NCHRP report 903 can be helpful in that. Um, 
the uh, again the a lot of this work is and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is coming out of NCHRP report 903. I was the principal investigator along with a, a, a good team of partners that, that I'll mention here in a few. And what I'm going to cover today is, uh, again, why do we even want to, what are geotechnical assets? What do we mean when we say that word? And, and why might we include them in a transportation asset management plan? Uh, also, um, We'll then go into how we can use the NCHRP report 903 as a, a way to get started with geotechnical asset management impl implementation or to uh, supplement work that's already been started. So when we say geotechnical assets, uh, what do we mean? Um, you know, these would be the four types of uh, assets that could fit within the geotechnical asset definition. Um, really, these are earthwork assets. They're built with plans and specifications. Um, they're within our right of way. Uh, you know, we have a maintenance and ownership responsibility, and there's also a life cycle um, performance period and expectation that goes with each of these assets. When we say retaining walls, that's I think probably one of the most easiest uh, for everyone to conceptualize. In reality, retaining walls are everywhere once we start looking for them. Um, as Gavin's going to point out, you know, even in a, in a relatively flat state like Louisiana, we have a lot of retaining walls. Um, in fact, more DO, uh, a lot of DOTs are finding as they develop their inventories that they have just as many, if not more, retaining walls, both in a straight um, count aspect and in linear footage. And also, where we have an inventory of retaining walls and that's tracked over time, the data show that there's a growth rate on um, retaining wall uh, inventories. Um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, retaining walls weren't as common as they are today. Uh, you know, as we build up against right of ways and we try to, to use, uh, you know, reduce uh, footprints, retaining walls have become more and more common. So they're kind of like a first generation geotechnical asset that we're learning about now in the operations phase, in the ownership phase. Uh, embankments, again, so this is a constructed earthwork, uh, you know, often to raise grade around uh, surrounding terrain to keep the highway profile level. Um, within the 903 report, uh, the guidance suggests uh, starting an embankment or, or placing an embankment into an asset inventory with a height, a minimum height of 10 feet. Uh, that's not an arbitrary number. That was based on practices that um, we saw in the United Kingdom where they've been doing geotechnical asset management for well over a decade and they have a quarter million assets in their system. So it, it's, it's a number, it's a threshold that um, has some evidence behind it and, and has shown value in other uh, systems. Slopes or cuttings or cut slopes as they're often called. Again, these uh, rather than fill being placed, this is where we're excavating into the terrain, it can be soil, it can be rock. Um, oftentimes, uh, these slopes transition outside of our right-of-way into a native slope, so we can have deterioration effects from within the cut slope, and then we can also have natural slope movements that originate beyond the right-of-way uh, that, that can, can combine to create uh, threats from these, these types of assets. And then finally, uh, subgrades, uh, you know, subgrades are really ubiquitous throughout the system. Uh, these can consist of, uh, you know, improved subgrades below the pavement zone. Uh, so geosynthetic reinforced zones, uh, ground improvement works, uh, other inclusions like geofoam. Again, uh, assets that are built with plans and specs and they have a life cycle aspect to them and, and often have a maintenance um, considerations that we need to consider as well. Um, so what about uh, existing uh, rockfall and unstable slope inventories? You know, Silas touched on this uh, in his introduction. Um, you know, roughly uh, 25 states have developed some form of these uh, going back uh, several decades, uh, back into the 1990s in some cases. Uh, well, these can be brought into the asset management framework and it's encouraged to do that. Um, and I think it's important to point out that oftentimes an unstable slope is a failed asset that's really just for forcing action. There's other slopes in, in the system, but
but the rockfall hazard or the unstable slope inventory is really built around those slopes that are failing. Um, you know, Ty Silas uh, also mentioned uh, the MSC retaining walls. Those are another type of geotechnical asset that, that early indications are showing um, that the, the sooner we can get those in a man management framework, the better. And I think that's a key point uh, throughout this, uh, this work is that um, the geotechnical assets, they don't need to be distressed to qualify for an asset management program. Uh, the best opportunity to manage a geotechnical asset is before it's failed or before it's forcing failure. You know, just like in bridge and pavement asset management, we don't manage only the unstable bridges or the unstable pavements. We manage good to poor assets. And, and really the opportunity is to, to take those good and fair assets and manage them to their lowest life cycle cost to preserve them, to get the most life out of, we, out of them that, that we can at the lowest life cycle cost. So what are the benefits and, and why should we even be thinking about geotechnical assets in our asset management plan? Uh, the reasons are common uh, that we would see are, are consistent with what we'd see for other assets. Uh, you know, so there's uh, benefits to life cycle costs, uh, reductions in delay, uh, and that transitions into economic impacts. Um, I think those last few bullets there, the removing of gaps and, and the forecasting through time are key points because if you think about the, the retaining wall uh, example I, I mentioned earlier, where states have more retaining walls than bridges in some cases or, or just as many, I, there, there can be thousands of retaining walls on a system. If that's not known, that's, an, that's a gap in, in the risk process. And, and to add to that, you know, if you follow the news, um, roughly in the country, about two retaining walls every month will fail. Um, those aren't necessarily DOT walls all the time, but it shows that these retaining walls do deteriorate, they do fail, and they cause problems. So the ability to put that into our asset inventory to close that gap, and then again, continuing with the retaining wall example, um, a lot of these are first generation type assets. And so to be able to forecast and predict how those walls are gonna change with time is, is a real uh, big benefit to putting these in an asset management program. How much savings can we see? Um, you know, the evidence uh, when we looked at other systems and uh, when we looked at talk to uh, uh, Highways England, in uh, network rail in the UK where they've been doing this a while, the evidence suggested that they were seeing reductions of about 60 to 80% in their life cycle costs for geotechnical assets. Admittedly, it's a difficult number to quantify because if you think about the US right now, in a lot of cases, we don't even really have a good baseline to know what our life cycle costs are. It, it would all be on estimates. Um, and then as an asset management, plan uh, you know matures you're able to to get more precision in those values but where they were able to do that where they were able to get some uh some confidence in their estimates those are the savings that they reported seeing so so um a significant life cycle uh, benefit there on the screen right now is uh pictures of 10 different asset failures for geotechnical assets and we can see you know, everything from uh, maintenance needs, uh, er, er, emergency and maintenance needs, property damage, road closures, uh, property damage to both DOT and, and off right away or private property. And so these are all economic impacts. These are all disruptions. And again, if through asset management of these geotechnical assets, we can reduce the disruption that's occurring, what's the value of, of having fewer of those? I, I don't think, uh, it, it'd be a great aspirational goal to say that through asset management for geotechnical assets that we can reduce all failures or all adverse events. I, that's, that's probably not feasible right now. But if we can reduce them, there's an obvious value to be gained um, for, for the owner of those assets. So um, what are some of the ways we can start with geotechnical asset management? Or we, uh, and where I'm gonna talk about today again is this nchrp report 903 this was released just uh under a year ago 
Um, and it contains two volumes. Volume one is uh, contains a synthesis of the literature review, the case studies, uh, and a lot of the basis behind what went into the framework that's presented in the implementation manual. NCHR per, uh, Report 903 um, is the output from NCHRP Study 2446, which was started in 2016. Um, the, the objectives behind this study were really to get uh, geotechnical asset management into a framework and into a taxonomy that could align with transportation asset management to make it such that states could start on their own uh, to have um, uh, tools and resources that geotechnical engineers, planners, maintenance staff could use to, to start. Um, and uh, as part of the work, we, we really looked to find successful programs out there, uh, understand what are some of the barriers to implementation. And, and to do that, it, it took a cross-disciplinary research panel um, uh, we had geotechnical expertise, uh, myself, Eric Lohr, and Vern Schaefer. Uh, we, uh, uh, Bill Robert and Omar Smadi uh, provided the TAM, TAM expertise, and then Scott Richrath was the co-PI with myself, and uh, he really helped on bringing those executive and financial uh, perspectives. And again, the goal here was um, to really create a way that we could bring uh, geotechnical, all geotechnical assets into under one umbrella for an asset management plan. So again, I mentioned volume two of the work um, is the implementation manual, and it, it's purposely designed to be simple. It's it's directed at a simple level of asset management maturity. Um, it's uh, uh, you know within a few pages of the manual. The users or the readers can uh, start walking through what it takes to build an asset management plan with their own assets. They're encouraged to do that. Um, it's uh, and then also within the implementation manual are a couple of Microsoft Excel-based implementation tools. Um, again, so uh, users of the manual don't need to go procure specialized software. They can use off-the-shelf or turnkey. Um, tools to, to get started because uh, one of the things that we learned in looking at other successful systems is just the importance of just starting um, over um, you know uh, getting everything uh, perfectly uh, precise or whatever um, it, it's most important to get started and start building these inventories and doing the assessments for that to happen uh, within the manual it has um, a uh, workflow for starting or, or doing geotechnical asset management. That workflow uh, splits. It has a, uh, a top uh, uh, route where we can do life cycle uh, analysis, life cycle cost analysis at an individual asset level, at a project level. Um, and then the lower uh, part of that framework is really directed at if we have a large program of assets that we want to start building an asset management plan and doing long range uh, financial planning and, and such. So to take a look at this uh, top part of the framework where we uh, look at the asset and the project level uh, decision making, um, again within the report is a spreadsheet that helps a geotechnical engineer, an asset manager, a designer uh, do trade-off analysis at the project level, at the asset level, so they can look whether it's a new asset that's being placed into service or they're rehabilitating or trying to make some decisions on one specific asset and they have a baseline condition and they want to compare different treatment options, different uh, design options that could be uh, used. Um, and, and the whole goal of that spreadsheet is to, to enable um, users to make informed trade-off decisions about uh, their geotechnical assets. So for example, the image on the left shows both of these images uh, accomplish the same objective of protecting the road from a deteriorating slope or a rockfall slope, um, but they have different operations and maintenance considerations. And so the photo on the left shows us a, a steep slope, but uh, we might have to 
procure more right away or we might have to go through a right away acquisition process to lay that slope back flatter. But the outcome of that is we end up with a simpler system to maintain. Uh, it might need more frequent maintenance, but again, it can all be maintained by the agency. Whereas uh, the photo on the lower right, um, maybe in this situation, we don't have to worry about that right away process, but we're installing a more expensive uh, mitigation system and we have different maintenance trade-offs that go with it. So again, by using that life cycle cost estimating worksheet, um, they can make an informed decision uh, that considers that decision in the context of asset management objectives. The next part of this is, is more if we want to look at, at the program of assets and the decision making around that. Um, the report includes a, a software or a spreadsheet called the GAN Planner. And this is a, a view of the starting page of that. Uh, again, this is uh, in, in purposely de uh, designed to be a simple uh, and, and a quick start type of a tool. Um, there's default asset models in the system already. You can create new asset models uh, when, when uh, you feel the needs there or as you become more familiar with it. You can build your inventory through this. So over a period of months to years, you can be continually adding to this. And then the system does its assessments uh, you know, the, um, the requirements really are to put some sort of identification into the system, you know, a mile marker or just a, some sequential number, whatever's easiest, uh, assess um, the condition of the asset, assess the impact uh, to mobility criteria and the impact to safety criteria, all in a 1.5 rating, and that transitions into a performance score. Um, and then the models also do deterioration um, analysis uh, to help with uh, financial planning. So there on the right in the pie charts, you can see uh, a conceptual performance uh, dashboard. And, and one of the performance measurements is what we call the level of risk, uh, LOR. And this is a single measure. It's thought to be, uh, it could be comparable to like a level of a service only it's the combination of the condition of that asset and what it does to our performance objectives. And we're trying to roll that up into one single measure for reporting. This is a dash, another view of the dashboard view. Again, because the models are looking at deterioration effects and, and how things are changing with time, uh, the GAM planner can help uh, the user generate a 10-year financial plan. Uh, you can look at your baseline funding, you can look at different funding scenarios and how that might affect your performance with time. Um, last, within the implementation process, um, you know, just like bridges and pavements, we recognize that there's going to more than likely be way more needs than there are funds available for making asset management decisions in a program. And so the 903 report walks the user through um, a a risk-based prioritization approach that can be uh, um, a tool in talking with transportation asset managers, with executives um, and, and program engineers about ways to further prioritize that list, you know, whether or not it's looking at concentrations of risk or maybe only looking at risk that originates in the right-of-way or certain critical corridors. And the, and the goal behind all of this is really we want to enable the asset management staff and the geotechnical professionals that no matter how much money they may be given, if it's a low dollar amount or a high dollar amount, what can they do in the context of managing these assets for the greatest return on investment? And with that, that uh, kind of wraps up my part of this discussion. Uh, my information's here, it'll be in the slides. Um, I know we'll have a questions comment here afterwards, but I'd also encourage, um, you know, I'm, I'm always interested to hear how the implementation is going or if there's questions. So uh, I'll always put that offer out if you ever uh, feel free to contact me. Thanks, Mark. That was a great presentation and I know I learned things from it. Now, just a re quick reminder, if you do have questions for each of our speakers, just ask them uh, through the Q&A panel on the, the webinar menu bar. and um, and then we're going to take them as they as in the order that they were asked. So while you remember them, it might be good to just enter it there. 
For our next presentation, we'll hear from Chris Merklin from the Ohio DOT. Chris is the administrator of the Office of Geotechnical Engineering at the Ohio DOT. Chris has 30 years of experience working in geotechnical engineering. During his career, he's worked in multiple roles as a geotechnical consultant, a geotechnical design coordinator, coordinator, and now as ODOT's Office of Geotechnical Engineering Administrator. Okay, Chris, it's yours. Great, thank you. Uh, just checking to make sure you can hear me and see my slides. Yes, on both. Great. All right, wonderful. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we here at ODOT are nowhere near the expert that Mark is on asset management, but uh, we've been going to the asset management uh, school of hard knocks for 20 years now, so we've got a lot of experience to share with you. Um, I start with a quote from uh, the Geotechnical Asset Management uh, for Transportation Agencies, Volume 1, that Mark referenced and, and authored. Um, and it says, historically, geotechnical assets have been treated as hazard sites that create unpredictable financial liabilities to operations and or have been ignored until failure forces unplanned action. Well, that was us. Uh, we consider ourselves historic, having started in the 90s. And I ask, uh, or I wish, uh, NCHRP 903 was around in 2000, because uh, we would have loved to have started with that rather than blazing our own trails. So our, uh, our GAN beginning uh, began with a liability. Uh, in 1995, we had a mine collapse on uh, Interstate Route 70 in eastern Ohio. It closed the interstate. Uh, and that uh, uh, triggered us to, first of all, repair that site, uh, but look at a um, uh, inventory and risk assessment for abandoned underground mines. Our, our chief engineer at the time was from that district, so there was quite a bit of motivation to uh, figure out uh, where mines are and uh, the hazards that they pose uh, to us uh, in our uh, roadway system. So we began in 1995 with a uh, uh, committee to uh, uh, to write, both author and uh, uh, create uh, what became the Abandoned Underground Mine Inventory and Risk Assessment Manual. Uh, so that took about three years there. Uh, and then we started uh, with inventorying uh, once we had our manual. And the trouble with mines is, uh, underground mines especially, is you can't see them. So uh, we needed to find out where the mines were. And uh, our Department of Natural Resources, uh, they hold or manage all of our uh, underground mines in the state of Ohio. And they had our paper mine maps, uh, but not uh, digitized. And so they don't have a lot of resources, funds, let's say. And so we... Uh, uh, help them to digitize those paper mine maps. Uh, and so we spent uh, the next several years cataloging and, and digitizing those maps, uh, creating a database, and then building a GIS application for georeferencing those mines with respect to our roadway system. And then we began inventorying uh, in uh, April of 2004. And then uh, around July 2008, we had our first, uh, our initial uh, complete uh, Abandoned Underground Mine Inventory uh, and Risk Assessment um, uh, System. So as you can see there, starting in basically 1998, it took us 10 years to get uh, from uh, concept to, uh, to complete uh, uh, inventory. So that's quite a, uh, quite a bit, of, bit of time and quite a bit of money spent there also. Uh, many geotechnical variables, how to, uh, how to consider the, uh, the risk of an abandoned underground mine, uh, the GIS and data collection management variables, which uh, in the beginning you're not necessarily much of an expert at, but then you soon become one there. And then the hardware and software variables, um, contracting with uh, uh, universities, uh, contracting with uh, software vendors, uh, changing hardware and software, so uh, uh, some moving targets along the way. So we, uh, throughout the whole process, we were not... Uh, simply going to do just mine. We wanted to do a holistic approach. Uh, so through that process, we were also considering uh, other, uh, what, what, the overall system, as we call it, the geotechnical data management system. Uh, and we had warehouses full of uh, boring logs and uh, plan sheets uh, that we wanted to uh, scan and make available uh, electronically. So that was our document management system. Uh, we also had internal operations. Uh, 
and we wanted to create a lab information management system or a LIM system, uh, and ultimately that would grow into both a uh, electronic capture of, uh, of any uh, field exploration data all the way through the lab and then into the presentation report format uh, is what we wanted to eventually get to there. Uh, and then what I'll talk primarily about here today is our geohazard management system. So that was our holistic approach that really began around the same time that we were starting our Almira uh, inventory system. So a lot of um, uh, parallel tracks going there. So our GHMS uh, does consist of the mines, which I just spoke about, the uh, underground mines. Also, we considered landslides and then rock slopes or rock fall sites as well. Uh, and um, you know, when you begin this process, uh, it would be great to look at the entire uh, fill slopes and the cut slopes uh, uh, completely. But um, what happens is you are forced into, when you first start this, that you do have a lot of sites out there that are problematic. And so you want to focus on those uh, first, and then you find out you have an awful lot of those. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, so through this process, um, we didn't necessarily get a lot of internal assistance uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, our information technology group was very busy with other um, uh, commitments, and so we had to kind of go it ourselves. And so uh, through SPR funding, uh, research contracts with um, universities, uh, and then them contracting with uh, software uh, uh, companies and, and, and uh, uh, consultants to help write code, uh, again, it's a uh, it's a long process. Uh, you're 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 developing uh, the process as you go. Uh, we created uh, an inventory and rating system for landslides and rock slopes as well. And so, uh, again, uh, it's a great idea in the beginning, but it, it definitely takes quite a bit of time and money to to make it all come to fruition. So where we are today, we've got a little less than six thousand rock slopes in our inventory. Uh, uh, almost 10,700 landslides that are inventoried of varying uh, degrees of degradation, and uh, almost uh, 1,200 abandoned underground mines that have been inventoried. Uh, our inventory covers our state highway system only, uh, and we have a tiered rating system. Uh, so basically, the lower the tier, the lower the risk, and the higher the tier, the higher the risk. So there are tiers one through four. And then uh, reinspections are required based on the severity or the degree of degradation of each site. Uh, our tier one sites are considered basically a, a low risk site, uh, low to moderate, uh, is not rated. Uh, tier two, three, and four are all uh, received detailed ratings uh, for those uh, as far as a numeric rating. And then ultimately those uh, would then go to be considered for programming repair sites as well. So, the severity of the ratings. Uh, for rock slopes and landslides, our tiered rating system is based basically on two concepts. Uh, first of all, what is the likelihood that the landslide will continue to move or that the rockfall will generate rockfall? Uh, and then secondly, uh, what is the likelihood that the road will be affected by that continued movement or that rockfall? And so basically, it's on a low, uh, moderate, uh, high, and a very high uh, uh, rating system. So then after a site is repaired, uh, we do not remove it from our inventory. Uh, we want to reinspect it uh, as geohazards go. Uh, you may do a repair, and a repair may simply be a maintenance repair and not a designed repair. And so uh, there is certainly the possibility that it will continue to move, maybe at a much slower rate, uh, but still continue to move. And so we want to keep those in the inventory to keep an eye on those. Going forward, uh, we are moving to collector in RTIS. That's in uh, this next fiscal year. Uh, we're going to modify our tier determination to uh, address all assets and not just simply effects on our roads. So uh, maybe effects on high mass power lighting, uh, obviously structures. And then um, it, through this process, we're getting significant internal assistance because uh, asset management is a priority for most DOTs these days. And so clearly, um, uh, our asset management team is building our collector uh, system and helping us uh, every step of the way. So that's very uh, beneficial these days. So a few examples on the left there is just simply a landslide that's a, a tier one or a low risk site. You see some movement there uh, that started, but uh, low low risk of, of reaching the road and continuing movement. And a rock slope on the right side with about the same condition, very low risk. 
Tier two, uh, this is a landslide with a, that has had some remediation done with the piles driven there in the past. Uh, and we consider this basically a moderate risk uh, to continue moving and affecting the roadway. Tier three here is a, uh, I'm sorry, tier two is a rock slope uh, that's shown uh, evidence of rock falling, but with the uh, the permanent barrier there, uh, the, the risk uh, to, the, to reaching the road is, is low to moderate. Uh, here's a, an example of a tier three landslide site that uh, has started to affect the shoulder there. You see the barrels. And so basically it's in the moderate to high uh, risk rating of continuing to move and uh, eventually affecting the roadway. Same goes with a rock slope here, uh, very little catchment. And so the likelihood of reaching a rock falling and reaching the roadway is in the moderate to high range. And then here is a tier four example, which is immediate action uh, uh, rating basically, where we have a very high risk. This is the shoulder that's been affected by a landslide. And so the risk to the traveling ro uh, pavement is um, uh, high to very high. And then of course a rock slope here that it's a little late on this one, but uh, uh, we, we have ones that are obviously uh, uh, a little uh, before this that we can take action on. An example here is on the left is a tier two site, uh, so a moderate risk site uh, in the 13 and 15 inventory cycles uh, that eventually grew to a tier four site in 2019. So obviously this is the uh, uh, see what's coming kind of situation. So basically we're adding about 100 sites a year to our inventory uh, and so continue to, to to go through that process and reinspect. So I'll take a, a quick tour here uh, to go to our um, our inventory, our transportation uh, information management system, and I'll show you a little bit of a uh, of the uh, population here, the the web-based access that you can have. I like to click on the geohazards and open up our landslide rock falls and our Myra sites, and then I always include our borehole locations and our project limits there because that information is extremely valuable, and you can zoom into these sites. And you see the uh, the targets pop up there. The uh, the triangles are landslides. The circles are up in underground mines, and the um, squares are rock slopes. And so, for example, if you were doing a, a roadway project at this interchange here, you can see that you've got quite a bit of uh, of inventory geohazards in this area. And then the user can click on these uh, these targets, and you get some uh, uh, identifying information over here. This particular uh, abandoned underground mine site has a score of 100, uh, and so you can get some pictures as well. But uh, this gives you the uh, the geo-referenced information here. You can click on the uh, the boring targets as well, and get boring information uh, logs and, and profiles here as well. So uh, very uh, very valuable, very quick access. We used to have to access that boring information in warehouses. So this is a much improved situation there. So retaining walls, uh, we began this process early 2010 when all uh, in, uh, asset management uh, teams were asked about uh, uh, prioritizing their asset management, and we certainly uh, uh, encourage retaining walls to be uh, inventoried. And so uh, our retaining walls were considered a tier two asset. So basically in priority, they wanted to create the asset management for tier one first and then move on to tier two. So uh, we wanted to only pursue an inventory at that time because when we get into the rating systems, it would become quite cumbersome and, and take longer, and we kind of uh, didn't want to take as long as we did for our, our initial uh, geohazard inventories. So the uh, beginning of that began in July 2015, and we uh, launched our inventory and our uh, training in 2018, so three years there, uh, all an internal effort for our inventory, and we've given our uh, districts uh, until August of 2021 to get all of the inventories in. And uh, our reinspection schedule on those retaining walls is every 10 years unless uh, distress would uh, uh, trigger a quicker inventory on that. Uh, the things we look at are function. Uh, we have four options there, grade separation, landslide stabilization, structure support, erosion protection. And uh, we also identify the wall type, uh, foundation type, base material. And this is all uh, in the office, uh, taking it off of plan and uh, existing inventories that, that the districts may have. So uh, the inventory uh, begins in the office. Uh, we identify the location. Um, 
any association with other assets such as bridges or culverts. Uh, we pull the plans for the wall and then we verify from the plans the dimensions of the wall. And again, all of that's um, uh, entered in a desktop application for the retaining wall inventory. <coughs> so then heading out into the field to inspect the wall, uh, first of all, you verify the dimensions that you pulled off the plans and the location that the wall is where they said it was going to be, and it's basically to the dimensions that the plans say that it was built to. Then you're looking for uh, other features, deformation, uh, any damage uh, that might be, you know, either something running into the wall or just simply uh, some deflection uh, in the deformation aspect or just simply uh, a deterioration of the wall. Uh, if there is drainage uh, outlets or channels, are they functioning? Uh, check on that. And then there's a general rating of a good, fair, poor condition. Uh, and then any kind of condition comments. Uh, and then the engineer inspection, yes or no. So quickly, we'll just go to our to our um, dashboard here uh, to take a look at that. Um, so internally, we have a dashboard. You see here, 3,158 retaining walls have been uh, inventoried so far. Uh, 1,331 still need inspection. And then 159 of those were considered to be in a condition that required an engineer's inspection. So those are tracked as well. And you can see the map over here of all of the retaining walls shown there. And then if you were to expand this bottom, you get a, uh, a graphical depiction of, of the different types of walls we have and how many we have. Uh, and then if we were to look in our, uh, our, our web-based uh, inventory of our retaining walls, we could, uh, again, go to our assets here. You see our statewide, all of our assets, we have many of those, as, uh, as was mentioned before, by the departments are, are, are accumulating these days. We click on our retaining walls, and then we could simply go in here and find one of our walls and, again, get, uh, get data as far as... Um, Click on that here. Missed it there. So you get some uh, information here of the, the inspection data right here. Uh, this one's been inspected. It's in uh, fair condition. Uh, doesn't require an engineer's inspection. And then if you wanted to, you could go take a look at the, uh, the plans. Those are attached. Click on that. And um, you can also take a look at pictures of the, uh, of the inspection such as this photo right here. And so again, uh, very convenient uh, uh, and, and available on the web. So going forward, we certainly see value in an, in an embankment uh, asset management plan. Here's a, an embankment that's less than 20 years old in North Central Ohio. It's not necessarily a landslide, but it's showing you know, extreme erosion. The district has been throwing some rock in there and these rills become gullies eventually, and so it would be nice if we got ahead of this and tried to avoid this and, and, and were aware of this at an early stage. And this is a picture of a landslide that was unfortunately discovered during a culvert inspection. And so again, if we had a good idea of our, our embankments in this area, this is a, a three to one slope, a high fill of about 60 feet with a very distinct spring line right through the middle of it. We could have caught this at a much earlier stage and, and spent a whole lot less money in repairing it. So we see value in this, and we hopefully are going to put some efforts in that in the future. And then also with subgrades, um, we've done extensive chemical stabilization uh, over the past uh, uh, 10 years, and we incorporate chemical stabilized subgrade into our pavement design, so we're thinning up our pavement. And so we certainly see value in, in finding and in, in locating our subgrade improvements uh, and, and tracking the conditions there as well as we've had some sulfate issues, and we've uh, also mapped our uh, high sulfate uh, soil uh, soil statewide. And so uh, that's another feature of that, that we certainly see value in tracking in the future. Uh, ground improvements, uh, we're doing more, more, more and more of those these days, and so uh, we would like to uh, incorporate that. So I think we'll put some effort uh, for sure in that going forward. And it seems a whole lot easier these days since we do have uh, uh, tools like NCHRP 903 and, and a very cooperative asset management team uh, at ODOT. So that's my presentation, and hopefully one day we find ourselves all uh, back together again uh, celebrating uh, uh, college football come uh, come fall. So uh, uh, with that, I'm I'm done. Thanks, Chris.
such a uh, motivating image, although quite scary at the moment to see that crowd. Um, impressive what you've been able to accomplish at Ohio DOT. So to wrap up our presentations today, we have Gavin Gautreau from the Louisiana Transportation Research Center, where Gavin is currently Senior Geotechnical Research Engineer. Gavin has been with the LTRC since 2002 and has been working in the geotechnical engineering space for over 25 years. Outside of work, Gavin is also an active member of both the Louisiana Engineering Society and the American Society of Civil Engineers, where he has served in numerous executive positions. So now let's hear from Gavin. Thank you. I hope you can see my screen and hear me. Yes, both. Super, super. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of our uh, geotechnical asset management project. Uh, it's just over halfway through. Uh, it was initiated through our research problem identification committee uh, meetings and sought to give these geotechnical assets a little more credit. We we have bridge maintenance and we have uh, pavement management systems, uh, but we wanted to give these geotechnical assets a little more uh, credit. So uh, it's nice to hear Chris's work. Uh, I think he's got a 20 year head start on us. So we appreciate that and, and learned a few things today too. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with Louisiana, here's a geological map, a generalized map. We're relatively rural and flat. Uh, with little to no rock or bedrock, we have a few cut slopes. But the, the Red River and the Mississippi River have cut through and left a lot of alluvial soil along with our soft uh, coastal marshes. We have some Pleistocene clays uh, around I-10, but those are also cut through with some other rivers. We have some some rock, some soft sandstone up in the in the northwest portion of the state where it gets a little more rolling uh, but for the most part uh, we get our rock from Kentucky or, uh, or other places. Uh, so we're left with a lot of soft wet clay subgrades and unlike Chris's excitement that he has with rocks we don't we don't have those kind of things in Louisiana but what we do have are a lot of problematic slopes and embankments uh, like I said, a lot of heavy clays, and with uh, over 60 inches of rain a year, these soils hold water and and have issues. Uh, even though we're rural, you know, generally these flatter slopes still have problems, and part of that is because over the years uh, we've gotten better, but you know, historically we had some either weaker material, allowed weaker materials in there, and so we have to deal with those uh, today. We do have some retaining walls. Uh, this is a shot up in Shreveport where we have uh, I-49 supported above on the left. Protect, and this wall is also protecting the, the frontage road, the entrance ramp. On the right, we have another wall supporting the back slope and a, and a railroad above that. But a few years ago, we were asked how many walls we had, and we just couldn't answer that question, which was kind of embarrassing. But now we have a better handle on that and are working to improve on that. But uh, we still have some work to do. But but how are they performing? Most of them are probably performing pretty well, but we needed that initial assessment to see how they were performing. We want to include other other data like Chris's uh, hazard data, we, we spend work and money uh, and efforts repairing slopes and, and doing work, but we should record that for future reference, what was done, how it was done, and, and for the future, succession planning in a sense. We have uh, levees along our highways to protect us from the Mississippi River and flood surge. Those aren't necessarily our assets, but they are. We have roads nearby them, and they could be affected. We have some tunnels uh, in the South Louisiana, and there are retaining walls associated with those. 
we should make sure those have the respect that they deserve as well. And we are a petrochemical industry uh, state with a lot of oil and gas and the salt domes around the state. Uh, recently, we had a, a salt dome that endangered Highway 70, and, and that's just one location. And if we look at the map on the right, there are plenty other salt domes. We should plot those in our GIS to see what other road assets are near those. Like Chris, uh, we have some sulfates in our, our, our state, but sometimes we even allow them. They're not necessarily natural. Uh, and so when mixed with cement, they can heave. And so we want to uh, plot those in a GIS so that we can address those later uh, if there needs to be any reconstruction or rehabilitation to use the right attitude. Uh, and regarding our geotechnical exploration data, we've worked on some projects to build that, to go more digital from those PDFs and paper copies. We're transitioning from Ghent to whole base, which is a, a, a more robust system uh, and are working to make our data digs compliant so not only that we can share data but get data from our consultants uh, as well as whole base has gis features that will allow, allow us to show our walls in conjunction uh, with our associated borings soil borings or cpt data so how do we start we started lean uh, we started with our retaining walls uh, and those are mostly along our high ADT corridors uh, in contrast to the slopes and the culverts which are either too numerous or too small to see. Initially we started with these high, uh, high ADT corridors, the congested areas where these retaining walls are going to be at crossings of rail, water, or highways. So we started with our retaining walls. And so how do we do it? We used uh, Google Earth and Google Maps. The street and 3D views allowed us to, to pull information from the web, uh, where those walls were located, where they started, where they stopped, what type of facing. And so we were able to collect a lot of information from the computer rather than driving the four hours to Shreveport to do an inspection from a road and, and have to worry about getting hit by a, a vehicle. So these flyover scans were very helpful to build this initial database of walls. And so we drew those, those walls in ArcMap. We, we were originally thinking to put them in Agile Assets and we may be able to do that in the future, but uh, the ArcMap has the GIS features that allowed us to plot those where they actually lay rather than uh, you know, down the center line of the road. Uh, and, and we plotted the different walls in segments based on what their purpose was, what their facings were and location. And so you can see that the different segments are represented in different colors and numbers. And the different segments combine with each other to make us a, a continuous wall because one wall or one segment is connected to another segment even though they may have different properties so we wanted to separate those out and link them to the the lrs id of the adjacent road that they are supporting or, or connected with and we used our technicians to collect some additional data from uh, other resources within the department Rather than have everyone in ArcMap, we were able to export that into Excel files so they could add that material and, and information. And then we can pull that back into our database uh, later. So as an example, up in Shreveport in the Northwest corner of the state, we have Shreveport. And if we look at this map of the walls that we've collected, you can see them in blue. There are a lot of them in Shreveport, partly because I-49 is a fairly new interstate that was squeezed into an existing city. And so with less space, we we end up with steeper slopes and eventually a wall. And so there are a lot of walls in this area 
in this urban area, which is uh, costly at the time, for sure. So just in this screenshot, we have 55 continuous walls, 154 uh, segments, uh, and it totals up to about 10 miles worth of walls, which is about half of the walls for the whole state. Uh, we haven't calculated out our the wall facing, but so these are just are based on a linear linear number, but it's likely going to be more because there's a lot of elevated interstates through here. So we design our walls for 75 years. Uh, some of our, I guess, our GRSs for a little longer. We only have two of those. But we didn't know how old our walls were to even know where we were in that 75 years. Uh, luckily, our friends at uh, Reinforced Earth Company were able to share some of their records, and we were we we plotted that information. And most of it was related to the I-49 construction. And we can see there's a huge ramp up in in walls for that construction. And and those earliest ones are about 35 years old, which is about halfway through that. 75 year uh, design line and you know if we plot that full thing out we're, we're out to 2060 2065 we may we may all be old by then but the department's going to have uh, some costs associated with those as they reach that 75 year design line additionally uh, those early walls use metal anchors and so you know that northern part of the state does get a little snow it does snow in louisiana mostly in the northern part of the state but uh they do salt up there and so that may actually affect the uh the lifespan and, and so we want to exhume some of those to check our corrosion rates uh, we used uh, the report that mark referenced 903 it was very helpful uh, insight uh, and uh, examples we also used the geocomp report with the help of Jerry DiMaggio and FHWA at the time. Um, specifically, we are incorporating their operation and maintenance uh, and condition trees, uh, the assessments. They have three of these. The first one is operation and maintenance. Basically, is the wall functioning or not? Uh, and these are some simple uh, evaluations, assessments to help separate those walls out that are functioning from the ones that are not. Uh, so the first one, operation and maintenance, uh, is it is it in good condition? We would give it a one if, it, if so. If it's not, if it's in poor condition or critical to fail, we'd give it a four or a five. The second uh, tree is the safety consequence tree. And this one, has, if, if the, has the wall had any crash history? Is it causing any problems? Is it safe? And we could go from a one down to a four or five with five representing a fatality or an injury to represent that wall. And the third consequence tree for to assess that wall uh, and how it's affecting goods and services from getting to market, you know, is could that wall affect traffic? If not, we would give that a one. Uh, if it's gonna cause closures, we might give it a four or a five if it's severe for several days or a major economic impact. So these three assessments, we developed a web app through ArcGIS Collector so that our district uh, personnel could, could assess the different walls throughout the state with those criteria. And they could do it from their office or their field. Uh, and if they were in the field and didn't have a connection, they could sync that up later. But here's an example, and, and, and how this would work is they can see these different walls that are in their area, and the completed ones might be in one color. The ones that they need to address are in another color. And then for each wall, there are drop downs for the three criteria, assessment criteria. And we've outlined what those numbers mean, and they can click on the appropriate uh, condition and once they have all three rating criteria they can submit that and that data goes into our 
our database from the field so that we have people who are familiar with those laws doing these assessments. That's where we are now. Uh, we're, we're collecting these ratings. Uh, when we have these ratings, we can plug these into the NCHRP risk analysis calculations. They're pretty simple, where they have some uh, multiplication and addition to come out with a letter grade, like a school grade, to represent the amount of uh, risk and exposure. So once we have that, we'll be able to sort that and determine, hey, which walls need more attention and determine uh, repair priorities, treatments, and plan for the necessary and future funding. So to summarize, we, we have had some challenges and uh, I hope to be where Chris is soon. Uh, but you know, to do that, we need to make sure we collect more of this data, uh, these walls that fall off the radar until problems occur. We need to, to be more uh, proactive in collecting data uh, like our Bridge, bridge maintenance and pavement management groups. Uh, unfortunately, the emergency funding is often the only recourse there or the, the, the main recourse for those districts. Uh, we're gonna have an issue with our walls that are at some point, you know, they're most of them are the earliest ones are about halfway through their design life. And, and so at some point those walls will reach uh, maturity almost simultaneously. So we need to start addressing them, making sure that, hey, these are okay and these can go longer or, or these need to be uh, addressed. You know, on the DOTD priorities, staffing and funding, again, who's going to do these assessments? Uh, where is the money for repairs going to come from? These are things that we need to deal with, as well as uh, inventorying these uh, smaller culverts and the numerous uh, embankments and slopes that are maybe less definitive compared to a wall where you can see a clear start start and stop uh, link. So again we're gonna we're gonna uh, co coordinate with our districts the collection of this data uh, and get those plans into the files. Chris sounds like he's a little I'm going to get some insight from him on how they can we can do that. Uh, we have over 30, 350 wall segments so far, and we're collecting data to go along with that. We'll collect those other assets, get the condition assessments from the districts, calculate those risk scores, uh, review treatments, and communicate those results via our report, the web, web apps, and the database to our uh, geotechnical and uh, transportation asset managers. So this is a follow-up on that first slope. They're working on it, but we can see that it's causing some barrels, and which no one likes to see. So we're working on that. And with that, I, I thank you and I appreciate the time to speak. Everybody stay safe. That was great. Thank you, um, Gavin, for that presentation. So that concludes our presentations for today, and thank you to all our attendees. Now it's time for the Q&A. So if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature of the webinar toolbar, and we'll take them as you type them. And thank you to those who've already um, um, asked their questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Silas who's going to moderate the Q&A. All right, thank you. And we'll try and get through these as quickly as possible. If there's any time left, I actually have some questions, but we'll save mine till last. Okay, so um, our first question is for Mark Vesely. Um, the comment was, it's fantastic to hear that our experience here in the UK has been used to shape some US practice. Great example, the benefit of sharing and learning. The question is, how are the deterioration rates in the um, GAM program tool derived? Are they based on expert input, evidence-based, or on a combination of both? Do they vary by geological material? So two questions, Mark. Yeah, great, great questions. And you know, the immediate answer to the question is uh, for the GAM planner, those models right now are informed by experts. Um, 
actually the experience of the UK is is uh, really valuable, and we want to. Uh, I think there's some great collaboration partners to work together on getting more evidence-based uh, models going. Um, that was a research uh, recommendation or an outcome from the project was one of the next steps here is to get uh, deterioration models that are more evidence-based uh, for all these different assets. And then, you know, to the extent that those can uh, be referenced to different geologic materials, different construction, you know, generations and practices, uh, you know, so for instance, the MSE walls, uh, different generations of corrosion resistance, and, and there's so many good variables out there that we can work into um, evidence-based uh, models with time. So hopefully that uh, answers the question. Okay, great. Uh, the next question um, is actually for Chris Merklin. And Chris, I'm not sure if there is an easy or efficient way to answer this, so I may have to put you in contact with the questioner directly. But uh, the question was, can Ohio DOT elaborate more on their rock slopes inventory and rating system? Uh, well, we actually have a manual that's available on our website, and we're, we're rewriting it to uh, as we migrate to collector. Um, that's probably the best uh, start for the, the person uh, to to go to our website and to uh, click on our manual, and the manual will outline uh, exactly all of the um, uh, the features that we inventory to rate rock slopes. Okay, great. Uh, for Chris again, in Thames, are the sites that need an engineer's inspection flagged because of the current condition or a tier category? Was that with respect to retaining walls? Um, I yes, that was in respect to your retaining walls portion. Yeah, your, so, so we, yeah, we don't have a numeric rating for our retaining walls, so uh, it's purely the observations of the inspector as they see the uh, the wall. Uh, most of our inspectors are are, are highway technicians, uh, and so uh, they're going to take a look at it and see if they see any distresses or conditions that that. Uh, in their opinion, compromise the the, uh, the performance of the wall, and then they will uh, uh, recommend the engineer's inspection. So there's not a numeric rating for retaining walls that uh, qualify it for that uh, that category. Okay, great. Um, all three of you, and I guess the one that knows the answer first can just jump in. Um, I've heard that Ghent is discontinuing and moving toward ho um, whole base. Uh, do you guys know when that transition will occur? And is Ghent being discontinued? And none of you may know. <laughs> I'm going to defer to Chris on that. <laughs> Maybe he knows. I will too. Um, uh, this is Gavin. I can I can say a couple things. Uh, I know we we had already started a migration to whole base. Uh, Bentley bought whole base, from what I understand, and so I know that'll so that helps that we've made that transition. Uh, I do not know uh, a closeout date for Ghent. Yeah, we've been told there there is no uh, intentions right now to discontinue Ghent. The intention, I guess, the, the new the new software is open ground, but uh, they would uh, uh, continue supporting both uh, Ghent and open ground. Definitely would. Okay, great. Um, the next question is for both Chris and Gavin. Um, how do you collect your current conditions of assets? Um, is it a visual-based um, collection, and are they adequate? Um, do you use um, unmanned uh, aerial uh, systems-based imagery that may provide more details of future performance? So those would be the first two questions, and I'll get to the last one after you guys uh, sort of detect those two. Go ahead, Gavin. <laughs> uh, we looked at using LIDAR to collect some of this data, but that is still in its uh, infancy here in, I guess, in Louisiana. Uh, and to get that data out in the time frame that we were looking to, we skipped that and went to uh, the Google Street Views and flyovers. Uh, but uh, I know that we have a separate project, and I think it would be probably a more site-specific thing to use uh, drones and uh, that type of technology. 
Yeah, similarly, we would. Uh, most of our uh, work is just boots on the ground. Uh, the, the the drones and and lidar are uh, are very very beneficial, but when you have thousands of sites, it's also very very expensive. And so I think our our more severe sites or our more uh, much more difficult to access sites might rise to the uh, uh, to the uh, remote uh, mapping level, uh, but the 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 majority the mass majority of our uh, inventory sites are are simply boots on the ground uh and and some there are subject subjectivity to the to the ratings uh, no doubt about it um you take measurements and uh, you do subjectively uh, uh characterize certain uh, uh inputs uh, that's i think with any uh, inventory but um uh, that's that that wraps it up for us Okay, and then the third question from uh, um, same person was, uh, um, it's really a hypothetical because I mean, both programs are on the downslope, but if LSU and Ohio State play for a national championship in 2021, who wins? <laughs> <laughs> I actually yeah. had a, a picture of our Joe Burrow Heisman <laughs> Trophy winner and I took it out. Uh, I, I should have left it in since- uh, See there, living in the past Ohio. already. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're giving. Uh, I don't think we're giving LSU any more football players for next year. So I got to pick a high. <laughs> I, I think somehow Clemson will be there, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, for Mark, um, in your application example of the barrier versus net my, um, mitigation systems, you mentioned comparing trade-off between installation and maintenance cost, uh, with one objective of protecting the road. Uh, the questioner wonders if the objective could be expanded to protect the road implementing sustainable infrastructure. If such, then how we could add sustainable sustainability metrics to this tool, for example, uh, resource allocation, which option better reduces waste and energy during construction and operation. Um, two, natural world, which one manages better stormwater or impacts less landscape, or three, uh, which one maximizes resiliency and is less vulnerable to climate change? A long question. Hopefully you got all that. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I'll take a stab. I, it's a it's an important question. Um, you know, the the tool in the GAM planner is is uh, a, 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 a kind of in a direct cost uh, benefit cost uh, type of format. If if someone was to use that and there was ways to quantify those other types of metrics, um, this uh, tool could could easily be used. There's also more, you know, complex uh, uh, benefit cost type um, analyses that can be done that um, where someone could bring all those criteria into the decision making so that that informed decision just becomes that much more informed across all different factors from safety uh, to direct costs to um, the, the sustainable infrastructure aspects and, and to really make that as uh, holistic as they could. Um, so yeah, there is some options to, to add other variables to this uh, table as presented. Um, you know, somebody that's uh, pretty uh, capable in Excel could probably even add more. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Be happy to talk about that um, individually too, because um, it is a it is a complicated uh, subject. Okay, great. Um, next question, um, and this is for uh, I guess both I guess all three of you guys. Um, I'd like to know if there is a common data collection tool that um, that you would suggest to have homogeneous data and asset management databases managed by different agencies. And um, I guess it's for all four of us, because I can start and say that um, as, as FHWA puts together a package to start to roll out, that will be one of our goals is to try and figure out how to put together um, standard is a strong word, but a, um, a platform um, which makes uh, all of the data somewhat similar, some of the, all of the ways that we would sort of put the data together similar such that we are better able to integrate into transportation asset management. But uh, Mark, Chris, um, Gavin, any thoughts? I, you know, Silas, I just to add, I would say that um, there, that is a, a great opportunity that exists out there. Um, you know, I think we can talk about how that can happen, but the 
the benefits of this shared knowledge, you know, for example, with the NCHRP report, we draw it on data sources from other countries, you know, retaining walls, embankments, yeah, there's, uh, there are some geological differences uh, amongst states and countries, but there's a tremendous opportunity out there, just like we have in the bridge world, in the pavement world, to really look at these data beyond just the state perspectives, right? Um, uh, just because we cross a state line doesn't mean deterioration trends change. So the the opportunity that exists by getting these into a into a single framework, um, I think uh, can, you know probably adds more value than we even can recognize yet. Okay, um, and a follow up specifically for Gavin. Um, you mentioned about Google Images, um, but at some places the images are four years old. Um, any other visual inspection methods that you use to collect the data presented? Uh we have an internal uh, GIS with some more current maps that we kind of juggled all three views to make sure that we were getting at least uh, more current. And then we're gonna follow up that with our district on the boot, the boots on the grounds that Chris said uh, to make sure, hey, did we get them all? Uh, do we miss any? Uh, and that type of way. So, so. I guess multiple maps, multiple views to get those that lean start to get as many things as we could get in there and then hope to confirm that more and build on that more with the people in the actual districts. Great. Uh, the next uh, the next few questions are actually all pretty similar and they actually mold into a question I wanted to ask. So I'm going to try and combine a bunch of questions here together um, and ask it this way. Um, how are your efforts being received in your states um, by your transportation asset management staffs? So how um, are your agencies able to formally incorporate um, your geotechnical asset classes as you're developing them into asset management plans? Um, are your systems kept separate in the states? And what challenges are you having communicating with your transportation asset management um, folks and plans? I'll start on that. Uh, this is Chris. Um, so we began totally separate. Our uh, our systems were hosted outside of our, uh, our our ODOT network, and so that was a challenge. Now we have since brought it into the ODOT network, or are working on that, and incorporating it into uh, uh, the rest of the asset management uh, uh, system. And so that that's been a huge uh, benefit to us. When you and, and I showed it there on on our uh, Tim's uh, website. So um, once you do that, I think it 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 convinces anyone who's doubting the value of of uh, tracking those assets and, and inventorying those assets. It it convinces them of the value. Uh, and um, uh, so so I'm I'm glad we're there now. Uh, I wish we were there from the beginning. And we're getting tremendous support uh, internally. Uh, and uh, with our geohazards, we do fund projects from that system, and so uh, we have a funding um, uh, pot uh, for for repairing geohazards, and and you can't uh, receive any monies from that pot unless you are actually an inventory uh, geohazard in our system. So uh, that's that's valuable to us. That's that's it. Gavin. Yeah. Uh, so right now, this is uh, in our research center. Uh, there's a you know the geotechnical design section. They are certainly interested in these uh, assets. Uh, the funding comes from another section, which you know they have a, the the TAM for bridges and pavements and these kind of things. And and so I guess as of now we're building this on the research side to be functional for the uh, for both. And at some point it will be incorporated uh, but for now it's still kind of in the building process uh, at this point so we are at um, just about 3 30 and we are supposed to end at 3 30 we still have about four questions left in here um, Perry I don't know if you want us to continue if you would like us to just take the questions offline and deal with them separately or so Silas, this is Kiana, and I suggest um, that we continue and answer the the okay. four questions, if, okay. as long as the panelists are willing to stay. Guys, you're all set? Yeah, that's not a problem. Yep, that's fine. Okay. 
Okay, well then we'll ask the next question. Um, um, uh, question for Ohio and Louisiana. Resources were are to be used on inventory and rating data. Um, so what are your resources being used on inventory and rating data? In-house engineers, consultant engineers, maintenance personnel, or others? And what have the results been with regard to um, consistency? I'll go first because uh, I think mine's a little more simple uh, than than Chris's. Uh, you know, this is still in our research center where we're doing this in-house. Uh, this is uh, DOTD staff uh, that are collecting this information. Uh, we haven't, we don't have nearly the number of, we don't have any rocks falls like Chris or, or these underground mines like Chris. But so these are walls and eventually we'll get to the slopes and culverts uh, but we're doing it in-house at this point chris yeah we uh you done gavin yep okay uh so geohazards we've done uh, data collection entirely uh, well i'll say predominantly with consultant contracts year after year roughly a half a million dollars a year and um uh, we did do a portion of it in-house through our office. Um, consistency is a bit of a challenge. Uh, you know, you definitely have to have training. Uh, you definitely, we, we offer uh, the training. Uh, we've had the same consultant for several years, so we had consistency there. Uh, this year, we're going to have a different consultant for the first time in probably a decade. Uh, and so we'll go through the training process there. Uh, but I think we're, we're, we're well versed in the system, so I think we'll be able to train it relatively easy. Retaining walls has been entirely in-house. Uh, and I would say, again, it's, it's new. Uh, I think there are some consistency uh, issues. We haven't been able to really uh, use the data a whole, a whole lot to, to understand what those uh, are. But for example, I think uh, uh, some of the inspectors are uh, are including barriers uh, such as a rockfall barrier in our retaining wall inventory, uh, but that shouldn't be in our retaining wall inventory. It should be under barriers, and so that might be one uh, misunderstanding, so to speak. So there is some growing pains. Uh, we hope to look at the data to see what those are, and then just educate um, uh, both the users uh, and the um, uh, data generators to, to get those cleaned up. Okay. Um, and then follow up, uh, and this is specifically for Chris, because uh, Gavin, I know yours is uh, tucked into the research department at the moment, but um, for the most part, as you guys move into implementation, are your geotechnical assets being named, um, introduced into the databases and quote unquote owned by the geotechnical group or are others such as district engineers or um, whomever else responsible for um, introducing assets into, um, into the groups um, with geotechnical people just sort of helping or championing, championing, championing. Yeah, we we are identified as the business owners of these assets, and so we're responsible for uh, basically the initial development, the training, uh, the creation of the user manuals, and uh, but we do very little of the actual physical uh, inventory. That's either done by consultant or the or the districts, and so. Uh, it, we're, we're decentralized, and so our districts ultimately own the assets, uh, all assets, geotechnical included. And so uh, we work with our district geotechnical engineers to uh, understand the inventory in each district. Um, we do train, uh, and um, I, I think that might have been the whole part of the question. There might have been something else mm -hmm. I was missing, but uh, uh, we are ultimately the business owners of, of, the, uh, of the assets, the geotechnical assets. Okay, great. Um, Chris and Gavin, both. Um, are you dealing with assets that lie outside of your right of way, um, but which may impact or threaten features inside of the right of way? Uh, yeah, we, we are. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, Chris. Yeah, we, we are. I mean, uh, clearly our, our rock slopes. Um, and our uh, our abandoned underground mines uh, may very well extend outside the right of way. Uh, that is a challenge to the uh, uh, to the inventory um, uh, folks to to figure out what exactly uh, the limits of the inventory are. But uh, we we tend to err on the side of caution and say, okay, let's let's try to capture that, and then we'll figure out later 
uh, the implications of that. But um, we we do um, uh, try to capture all that data uh, and then figure out uh, responsibilities and impacts later. Okay, great. Um, and we'll go. We'll just go, Chris, then Gavin. That way, you guys can jump jump all over each other. Um, uh, do do you guys have different funding pools for walls versus slopes or embankments? And if they are different, um, where do the separate pools come from? I'm sorry. The question: the funding so, pools between walls and, and other walls versus yeah, embankments or slopes. So, okay. Yeah, we do. Uh, our walls, we have no funding for our walls. That's an in-house effort, and uh, the creation of the system was an in-house effort, so uh, all entirely internal efforts there. So there's not a funding source for that other than through the asset management uh, group. And then our, our geohazards um, is um, is funded through, uh, it used to be through SPR funding, but then uh, they transitioned that to what we call our geohazard uh, uh, management funding, uh, uh, GSM, uh, Geologic Site Management Program, which has roughly $20 million a year. And so basically they're taking uh, a half a million dollars off of, off of the top of that to uh, continue to uh, uh, maintain the inventory. Yep. Uh, yeah, for on our side, it's, uh, like I say, in-house uh, research dollars at this point, and uh, I guess it, if we want to eventually move this into something else, it would be picked up. But uh, as of now, I don't, I don't have any other funding for those, those items. Okay, great. Um, let's see, um, Chris, uh, just wondering about the implementation of the Rockfall Hazard Rating System, which is recognized by FHWA in the Ohio process. Do you use it? And if not, is there a reason why not? So, so is that us using the FHWA Rockfall Hazard Rating System, yes. whether we use that or not? Yeah, so we we created ours before that existed. And so that, that was part of the whole pioneering effort that, that was mm -hmm. so challenging. Uh, and so we simply use ours. We, we did, um, uh, I think, uh, the uh, catchment ditch uh, uh, with uh, the design process of that anyway we do use but uh, as far as the rock slope uh, hazard rating system we were before that yeah and that's before my time but i'm pretty sure it's based on ohio's work i think that goes in the other direction so exactly. um so okay um a couple of last things here and we'll wrap up there were a couple of comments asking for the presentations you can download the presentations from today um in the little handouts um drop down menu on the chat on the pod itself. So if you go there, there's a link to download the presentations. Um, and the final question that came in uh, was, will either of you make your databases available to researchers for research purposes um, external to the states? That's a good question. I, I, we're not that far along to, to share it within our internal people yet, but uh, I guess at some point, yeah, we, we're looking into, uh, you know, lots of different uh, web app type functions uh, to not only share eventually, you know, uh, our, our soil borings and our, I guess our walls and our pile load tests, other these, these different assets and that we have, uh, if we can work around our, our IT security issues, uh, we hope to be able to share that, sure. Okay, Chris? Yeah, our, ours is out there from a web uh, uh, access uh, perspective and then uh, if there's you know actual like uh, uh, rating worksheets that uh, you know the, the the data behind the, the data that's, that's requested we would certainly make that available uh, and so uh, for sure okay and then finally there was a question about um, whether or not the reporting recording will be available the recording is available um, at the tamportal.com website where you actually registered for this webinar uh, so you can uh, grab the recording is available there. And that is it for our questions today. Thank you, everybody. Good questions. Thanks, Silas, for moderating the Q&A. That was a terrific session. And, and you didn't mention someone uh, suggested Syracuse. I'm, I'm assuming that that's in like um, Steve Gay's 
comment about Clemson. So <laughs> uh, he I'm knows, not a he knows that I'm a He knows I'm a Syracuse alum. <laughs> ah, that's why he put that. That's funny. All right. So, well, thank you all for um, staying with us. Uh, this has been a terrific session. Thank you to Silas and all of the presenters. Um, our next uh, bi-monthly webinar will be on on um, Wednesday, June 17th, and the the topic for um, oh it's not there, but the topic is going to be on the um, the TAMP and and SIP integration. So I think uh, it will be timely as people are working on their consistency reviews. But I think broadly, it's an important topic for TAM advancement is how do you connect the two in a more explicit way. So I hope you'll be able to join us and, and go back and uh, share what uh, the results of this webinar with others, um, both through the sharing of either the video or the, the presentation handout. Thank you all and, um, and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Yep, bye-bye. Thank you.